to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh, yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily, there's more to you than you think. Paul Check. Yeah, baby. My man. Welcome to life with you. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. I feel really good right now. I'm glad you do. Yeah. You deserve to. Thanks, man. <laughs> Everybody deserves to. They do. That's the thing. We have these stories in our head that tell us we don't deserve to be happy. Or maybe we're scared to be happy because if we're really happy, then we might die. Or you, then... might, you might be really healthy and have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's i think one of the big fears is we're afraid to enjoy life so much because we're afraid of the contrast of having to let it go so if we just keep ourselves at a at a low level of suffering or maybe sometimes extreme suffering then if something bad happens no big deal i'm already in the shit house anyways yeah so nothing to fear that's possible i mean that that sort of way of thinking is so far out of my wheelhouse <laughs> that i have to use my imagination to wonder what it's like to live that way yeah but I, I i you know if you can imagine it it's probably happening so i wouldn't doubt it i've seen it you know i've seen it in myself this little voice when i start to get really happy yeah it says don't do it just don't fucking do it really don't get too happy and i have to be like hello voice hello voice trying to keep me safe i understand what you're doing you're trying to prevent me from having the disappointment in case this you know temporal happiness ends yeah but that's absolutely the antithesis of the way to live because yeah. it's denying you the thing that you're trying to protect makes a great catalyst for growth though doesn't it it does so i mean all that that and any other such negative thing is really just a great opportunity to say oh thank you dear pain teacher for showing me where i have a mind virus and then just ask yourself what is my dream in regard to this well my dreams to have happiness all the time that's a more positive choice. Let's energize that and create a neural network to support it. And within enough time, you disempower the old network and you create a new one and all of a sudden you don't have those thoughts anymore. That's right. But it takes the discipline and the awareness to not wait till you're in a funk, but to catch it in its, you know, as it starts talking to you. And, yeah. You know, and that's where I really teach the name it, blame it, tame it approach. Ah, oh, you, you say, okay, there's my, I don't want to be too happy because it might come to an end voice. So we'll call it the, the Grinch that steals happiness. Mm. So whenever the Grinch that steals happiness shows up, you say, hello, the Grinch that steals <laughs> happiness. Thank you for reminding me that I am choosing to live with happiness and joy and trust in the universe. And then you blame it. Whenever the Grinch that steals happiness shows up i get afraid to be happy and and i actually don't enjoy myself near as much now you're cognitively aware of what was unconscious mm. so now it becomes an object instead of a subject right and you can't work with it as a subject because there's no way to define it and then tame it every time it comes up you just tame it and say thanks you're welcome to hang out with us and party or enjoy the sun and the you know beautiful beach or whatever but feel free to visit but don't pester me anymore or i'm gonna have to remove you from my mindscape that's uh that's the three-step strategy that makes a fucking lot of sense and interestingly I, I can apply this to i recently spent time with a friend and he has a really bad case of tinnitus or tinnitus how do you tinnitus what, tinnitus yeah. and, or tinnitus it's just you know garage garage yeah um and so he's in this constant state where it's it's very challenging and mm -hmm. you know i've never experienced it so i can only imagine how challenging it is mm -hmm. um and there's certain things that he could attempt but when i was really like getting down to it there's like he's a little bit afraid to try the last 
the last of the of the events because which if you, is what having his head cut off <laughs> yeah right i don't know there's but there's some procedures and there's some metaphysical things he could try there's, there's actually i've treated many cases of it and most of it is not accurately diagnosed one of the key things of tinnitus is nothing changes it not in volume not in intensity so for example, there's many things as a therapist that I know that trigger that. By the way, one of them is dehydration. That's the most common. Mm -hmm. If you get dehydrated enough, your inner ear fluids get so thick that they won't move properly. And a side effect of that is tinnitus. So whenever I meet someone with tinnitus, I just ask how much water are you drinking? So far, I've never met anyone that's even drinking close to enough water. Mm. Um, and the right type of water. Right. And it can come from very commonly come from upper cervical subluxation, which is the most common subluxation in the human spinal column due to the fact that the atlas has a uh, far greater range of motion and far less ligamentous stability than any other vertebra because it has to so you can rotate your head. Mm. Um, and there's techniques, there's a technique chiropractors often use where they have a pad on the wall like a wrestling mat and they will just gently bounce you off the wall and that can shock your inner ear enough to get the fluids moving again. I've seen that work for a few people. Um, there's one called the endonasal technique where they do something, I've had it done to me a few times, it's painful as hell. They take uh, like a condom and they stuff it uh, up your nose, both sides, um, and they use a blood pressure cuff and they inflate it and it actually opens up your yeah they oral do that with facial. broken noses for fighters yes. and things yes but it'll actually put so much pressure through your eardrums it feels like your eardrums going to pop but it can have a resetting effect and sometimes due to the um, misalignment of the facial bones and the cranial bones that endonasal technique when it, the few times I had it done it sounded like someone cracking an egg inside of my head because it was adjusting the bones so thoroughly. And so there's a number of cases of tinnitus completely clearing up with that. But actual tinnitus um, is more of a like a disease of the eighth cranial nerve or a, de a degenerative situation. And the hallmark of real tinnitus is that nothing can change it, not chiropractic, not sacro craniosacral, not anything. And so the second question I ask if, after how much are you drinking is, is there any time at all exercising, sleeping, making love, anything where the intensity of it changes, oscillates up and down, seems like it's less? And if the answer is no, that's usually a real case of tinnitus. And then you have to go to probably some more metaphysical type of techniques, either like the dispensa type of technique where you live in the reality in which you have no tinnitus and allow the great mystery to find a solution to the insolvable problem and manifest it in your physical form by the signals that you're sending with perhaps the help of plant medicine or something else, like that becomes the next avenue, right? Well, yeah, there's other things that you can do because a lot of the problems that happen to people with these chronic neurodegenerative type changes have to do with their diet and toxicity and so anything that disturbs the myelin sheath on the nerve can lead to all sorts of these unusual problems like tinnitus so the first thing i do is run a, an environmental panel on them uh, for environmental toxicity and look for things like heavy metals chemicals from buildings chemicals from plastics uh, xenoestrogens chemicals from cans and can liners. Um, and one of the most common things I find is in women is they're poisoned by their commercial makeup. There's many chemicals in commercial Or their tampons. I mean, tampons. there's a fucking enormous amount of toxins in tampons that don't even have to be listed. And then there's also a lot of food additives that attack the nervous system, unfortunately. Um, I've got a whole book on them. And uh, so really what I do is I clean people out, get their gut healthy, um, and get them eating high quality fats. And if I find reason to give them key supplementation to support that process, so things that support neurogenesis like lion's mane mushrooms and things like that, but almost always it has to do with some kind of disruption of either of the fat metabolism and or because the body shuttles toxins into fat to protect the organs, glands, and brain and nervous system. 
So the more toxic you are, the more toxic fat you have, and therefore you got all these chemicals in the fat. And if a person gets toxic enough and they go into the fat, the myelin on the nervous system, and it just starts to eat it alive and degenerate it. So in, in a lot of cases, there's a lot that can be done, but that approach is usually about a one-year commitment because uh, nerve regeneration is extremely slow. Mm. So having dealt with lots of nerve injuries, you have to be patient, but most people take a year to clean out and learn the new habits they've got to learn and get them to where they're doing it consistently enough that you have enough time for the cells of the body to replace themselves with clean, good food, which for a whole body, current science says is a year to turn all your cells over. It used to be seven years, but newer science says actually we're turning over every cell in our body every year. So I found with a lot of these types of cases, if you're not in for a year's worth of consistent participation in the therapist program, then you might as well go <laughs> see what they can cut out or <laughs> destroy for <laughs> yeah. you. Well, that's a, I'm glad you, you went down that rabbit hole because I'm sure there's people listening specifically who can get help from that and also understanding the conceptual framework about how toxicity can create just a general degradation of the, of the system. But where I was going originally was this idea about you know, the psychology behind it because mm -hmm. there's some aspect where he wanted to preserve this kernel of hope mm -hmm. in that I haven't tried everything, so there's a chance. Yeah. However, he didn't want to hope so much and actually go for it and try it because mm -hmm. of the fear of having that hope dashed and then him yeah. having to you know accept the reality that's quite that common with people with chronic conditions mm -hmm. yeah you, you get what's called illness behavior where you actually get so far down the line that you at a subconscious or conscious level don't know who you'll be without the problem and also people get um doctor fatigue and therapist fatigue because they've seen to so many doctors spent so much money so much time and they're not getting any tangible results. So they just basically reach the point where why friggin' bother? It's just going to be another round of the same crap. I've tried it 28 times. So, you know, I can feel empathy for that because <laughs> most of my clients are people that come with two medical files about two inches <laughs> thick, and it takes me about $10,000 worth of my time just to look through and see how badly tortured they've been. And, you know, I could go off on a long segue on that, but the, the, the reality of it is, is too, is that you can do the metaphysical type approaches. And of course, you know me, me, I'm all about that, but you can pray till the sun turns into the moon. If you're still eating crap and poisoning your body and all you're doing is fucking with God saying, fix this while I poison myself, would you? It's kind of <laughs> like, you know, thinking because you did ayahuasca that you're going to be Jesus tomorrow, you know? Wait, you're not? Well, you're always Jesus. It's just <laughs> how how many layers between what's on the surface and Jesus hiding inside there is. <laughs> yeah, there's a. It reminds me, you know, it's that it's that also that that hope is scary. You know, it's it's a scary it's a scary thing because it's setting you up for the contrast of that disappointment potentially. And uh, there's a Nietzschean interpretation of Pandora's box, the myth of that, which is really Pandora's amphora because they didn't have boxes back then. But ultimately they left, you know, in the myth, hope was left in the jar. And there's a lot of interpretations why hope was left in the jar. But Nietzsche's interpretation is that was an act of mercy from the gods mm -hmm. because hope was the most challenging of all the pestilences that could be on man because everything mm -hmm. else you can accept it in all suffering if there's no hope you just accept your fate but the moment you have hope you have the torture of that kind of tension mm -hmm. of like oh man i hope that this could be different and so you're in resistance and resistance is the actual definition of suffering otherwise it's just pain and we're yeah. very good at adapting to pain I know there's people that have these sort of dispositions. I mean, because as you know, I'm a therapist and work with all kinds of complicated people, but personally, I've never had anything but a great relationship with, I think the difference between hope and faith is very minimal. Mm -hmm. You know, hope, if you, if you have hope, then you have to have faith or why hope, right? Yeah, it's like hoping, the active and passive version. I think faith is just like, it's a stronger, hope is like, I hope it's putting the power out externally. Faith is mm -hmm. like driving that power. Like I believe, like I, I'm actively believing this, but it is, it is a subtle difference. Well, you know, like I, what if I'm 
got an airplane coming in late and I got a flight to get on and you know what happens like you're hoping you can make your flight I I say well I hope I make my flight <laughs> but I also say thank you great spirit I have faith that I'll make my flight and I just used the power of my mind to cause someone to spill something on the other airplane before they could leave the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but I'm mostly kidding. But, you know, for me, I think because I've been through so much pain in my life and had so many broken bones and internal injuries and bad concussions and just, just lots of fucking pain that nobody could do anything with. So I had to take it into my own hands, which now I realized God was saying, oh, by the way, you're going to be a therapist one day and you're going to have to learn to figure shit out for yourself because nobody in the medical system is going to give you much help. So I, I really grew into a relationship where whatever has me, I have found through, you know, I'm 59 now, so I've had time to experiment a lot. I've found that every single thing that really fucking put me down and made me <laughs> hope I would be able to return to normal, walk, run, jump, play, whatever, turned out to be an amazing journey that not only helped me learn and heal, but gave me all sorts of skills and levels of awareness that ended up being a great gift to countless thousands of people mm -hmm. helped me develop courses and say look this is where you can trust the medical evaluation this is where you shouldn't trust it <clears throat> and things like that so i think you know a lot of this boils down to people having not a depth not enough depth of spiritual awareness and connection that there's they don't have a sense of trust in the grand plan of the universe or, mm -hmm. or the world, or, or they don't have enough understanding of the true nature of God to feel supported in whatever's happening. Right. right. You, you had that terrible car accident. Right. And I'm sure that was like, oh my God. I mean, I remember seeing videos of you. You were pretty fucking, you know, up against the wall for a bit there. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have hope and faith and use your support system and keep your eyes on the target instead of in the pain, you could have turned out to be addicted to pain medications. I mean, that whole situation could have gone many different ways, none of which would have put you right in the seat with me smiling right now, right? So if, if, we, if we're... And I think that's part of the reason why people like me and you do what we do. And Joe Dispenza and many, many others, Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra, Ram Dass, the list is long, right? In some way, we've all had painful lives and we've all found ways to learn and grow from the pain and actually use it as a catalyst. So eventually you realize you've got a toolkit and when, you know, when the darkness shows up or the demons show up, then you say, you know, this isn't fun, but I know what to do. I know who to right. call. I know what books to look into. I know I can use the internet effectively. And even if I don't know what to do, the learning, I think this is the key thing you said there, the learning that goes with the trying and then the ability to share everything that you learned yes. makes it all productive. Even You're, if it's an absolute fucking dead end, you try yeah. something and it's like, nope. That's not it. Well, you can share that and then continue that infinite game for everybody else. Like, this yep. is how I was playing today. This is yep. what I tried. It mm -hmm. didn't work or it yep. did work. And then you share that thing. And then mm -hmm. it's becomes, it's just part of that integral consciousness. It's part of believing yourself as part of the whole rather than it's just me. Yes. Like, because everything you do, if it's part of the whole, then it makes sense. It's productive. Yes. It's, it's helpful. I personally, I have such a love of freedom physically emotionally mentally and spiritually that if any kind of anything physical emotional mental uh spiritual would be a kind of a, a different context but if anything starts choking out my freedom then i'm highly inspired to re get rid of the cage you know you know like if i have pain or going through like i've been through a divorce i'm like okay right now i'm falling into a situation either by gotten injured or by my own mind 
that I'm losing my own freedom and I don't want to lose my freedom. So I find whenever anything encroaches on my freedom to authentically express myself as a human being and in the world, that's the first priority for me to address. So what I'm saying, so it's clear, is that if we really value freedom, then we know that when the pain teacher comes, we need to be a very good student. And that usually means dropping a lot of the things you've been doing, like staring at televisions and phones and video games and distractions, which is the opposite. Most people drug up and fall deeper into that trap. But to me, it's like, okay, great spirit is having fun wrestling with me right now. I'm in a chokehold and I'm going to get out of it and right. whatever it takes. But you know, that adventure has taught me a freaking lot and it's led me to you know, oftentimes, for example, you, you find traditional medical approaches don't work. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. And the next thing you know, someone says, have you ever tried an Alexander practitioner? And you don't know what that is. And you study FM Alexander and you realize he was an orator and dot, dot, dot. So you say, well, let me go give it a try. And then the simplest thing, like little movements and changing your breathing and adjusting your posture and all of a sudden your tinnitus is gone or your neck pain is gone and you're like oh my god how come nobody knows about alexander work mm -hmm. and then i say okay now that i know i'm going to put it into the czech curriculum and i'm going to make sure that i know and so what i did for example is i went and got a lot of alexander enough to really understand the technique so i knew intimately from my own experience when do i refer someone to an alexander practitioner versus a feldenkrais practitioner versus a yoga teacher dot 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 mm. so i teach czech professionals on their level four test they have to identify exactly when you refer to 19 different medical and allied healthcare professionals because if you don't know that, then someone can get caught in a rabbit hole and then come to the end of the cul-de-sac and believe that's the end of it. When really, until you've actually had enough pain to have to explore a lot of opportunities, you don't realize how big the toolkit is out there. Yeah. The, you know, the pain is, uh, the pain is definitely something that can restrict your freedom. It's all too often, though, it's the fear yeah. It's the fear of suffering mm -hmm. that is actually the most limiting thing. It's constantly constricting us. It's like a jacket mm -hmm. with a cinch that's just getting tighter and tighter, like a corset. You know, and the more we're afraid of suffering in some form or another, the more restricted we are, mm -hmm. or afraid of death. You know, and this is you mm -hmm. we look out in the world, we've both been on airplanes recently and we're cruising around and and watching people react, and some people mm -hmm. are real relaxed, and some people are just so bound mm -hmm. by their fear of yep. everything that's going on in this COVID world right now that it's it's really interesting to see the dichotomy, which is actually physically displayed. Mm -hmm. You know, not only in their energetic presence, but also in their, um, you know, armaments. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it, fear is a necessary complementary opposite to freedom. So because mind operates on the principle of duality, you can't have mind without a duality. Um, and because the nervous system's oriented towards threat for our own survival, our biological systems know what a snake looks like and see it before our conscious mind does because they know that's a potential threat. But sometimes we think the rope is the snake, as you know. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making is you can't have freedom as a concept without the opposite, limited freedom. And fear is really boils down to um, anything that, stops me from doing the routine that I've convinced myself is what is the way I want to be. So if I'm going to, you know, a lot, a lot of people won't race a motorcycle because they're less oriented toward the freedom and the fun of going really fast and more oriented to the fear of a broken leg or a broken neck. Some people won't do anything for that. I remember Michael Jackson was a germaphobe, like people were cleaning his limousine constantly and all that stuff. Yeah, so here's a guy with tremendous freedom on stage, but as soon as he's not in his meditation, all of a sudden the other side of his mind takes over and there's millions of people. So all I'm saying is when we, whenever we have 
a negative polarity like that, that's our invitation to remember that one of the definitions of a spiritual master is someone who can turn a negative into a positive, and we're all seated with those potentials it doesn't just because spiritual masters do it doesn't mean we can't do it any as jesus said anything you can do i can anything i can do you can do better and so what i'm saying is is the fear the pain the upset the sadness the heartbreak they're things that we need to experience because it makes the spectrum of human existence real and and um diverse and exciting as you know I hate saying it, but you know, pain and and all and all that. Without it, then the other things have no value, through, right? We know through contrast, right? So, I think it takes a certain level of maturation and awareness of how a mind works to get to the point where you actually aren't the victim of the circumstance, but you realize that you now have tools and that it's a catalyst, and that it's giving you an opportunity to exercise the capacity of your own mind and to see other viewpoints that normally you wouldn't if you just stopped right there. So because it's biologically driven into us by nature, it takes quite a while for people to get enough psychological maturity to discern a real threat from a perceived threat. Right. And that, you know, that's like a lot of doctors will tell you that you've got such and such a disease, you're going to die. But until you've weighed out your options, that's only a perceived threat, right? And a lot of people weigh out their options and change their diet or, or heal their relationships and their tumors disappear. Or they go to holistic health people that give them the right diet and various approaches that almost anybody can do. And the next thing you know, they go back to the doctor two months later and they don't have a problem anymore, but the doctor was ready to cut their body open and pull out tumors and give them chemo or whatever. So I think part of it is we have to mature into um, asking deeply, what are my options and who else has gone through this and recovered from it and how did they go about doing it? And I tell you, if you actually start looking for who's had tinnitus or who's had fibromyalgia or who's had intractable back pain or any such thing and actually recovered from it, it's not hard to find people because usually they go shout off the fucking rooftops. Oh, by the way, you don't have to live this way. Here's how you can do it. I mean, I must have 50 books on cancer written by exactly those kinds of people that just couldn't resist telling everybody, oh, by the way, if you get cancer, here's 58 things that you can do that probably will address the issue, and you don't need to think it's the end. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the challenges, though, because fear, it limits our ability to think freely and mm-hmm. to think, you know, think rationally and explore options. It, it constricts our freedom to such an extent that we want to place our faith in what we feel is the best option and then close our eyes and ears mm-hmm. to any other possibilities. And I think, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons why that fear is so constrictive is we have this massive fear of death. Yeah. which comes from a deep understanding misunderstanding mm-hmm. of what death really is and mm-hmm. i think if we're going to if we're going to start going down and talk about all the ways that we start to you know unfetter ourselves yeah. from the chains that are binding us mm-hmm. you really kind of got to start with death and you got to understand like all right what is this thing mm-hmm. what is this ceremony mm-hmm. called death as ramdas calls it a ceremony mm-hmm. when you think about death because mm-hmm. you know you've certainly explored the realms beyond the physical body as much as anybody I know. Mm-hmm. When you think about death, what do you think about death? Like, what is what is your feeling about it? Well, I've spent a lot of time investigating death, and I've been through some profound death experiences, um, including uh, <laughs> running into a pile of logs going about seventy miles an hour on a motocross bike that was laying on the side of a logging road that was our racetrack but the guy ahead of me was kicking up so much dust in the summer that i couldn't see what was in front of me and he swerved around the logs and i didn't know they were there and they were like halfway into the road and i hit them full on flat out as fast as my motorcycle would go totaled my motorcycle 
flew about 50 feet through the air, landed in these logs, had a branch go right through my abdominal wall, and he had to, he didn't know what to do. I was maybe 16, he was 18. So he <laughs> draped me over his CR125 dirt bike and trottled me home about two and a half miles down the road. And they had a doctor come in an emergency to look at me and said, don't move him. He's in a very deep coma. And so uh, I was completely and utterly gone for two, probably two and a half days before I had any signs of conscious life in wow. me. And many times so deep in ceremonies, particularly DMT, that man, I was like, I, I didn't even know how I was going to get home. I was like in other <laughs> dimensions completely and scared to death. I mean, I have actually been so deep. I have found myself laying in my yard, crying for my mother, screaming, mom, mom, help, help, because I had entered the abyss and I was in just this vast, vast emptiness and felt like I was moving at the speed of light and there was just no top and no bottom and no sides. And I thought, fuck, I'm, I've just died and I don't know what to do. Well, you've died. Well, probably actually it's much scarier than died because I don't think that's yeah. where, that's not where we all go in, yeah. in my exploration of it. But it is one of the locus, you know, one of the planes of that's existence. only one one experience. <laughs> there's, <laughs> yeah. there's about a hundred more. <laughs> yeah, but I've actually investigated it not only in my own life, but I've studied it quite extensively, and I put a model together that I teach my um, HLC three students, which is the advanced holistic lifestyle coaching, based on that. Um, but I mean, uh, before I start rattling away, is there something specific you're wanting to me to share? Well, about I or? think, you know, <clears throat> death is, death is a multifaceted mm -hmm. you know, topic of exploration right now. I think every, a lot of people just think of it as the end. And then mm -hmm. some people think of it, oh, well, there's some kind of afterlife of my soul, but I think it's you know it's very like very loosely understood and then people just throw their hands up and there's all kinds of different you know uh facile you know kind of aphorisms like well you don't know until you do it you know and there's yeah. like there's a lot of reasons why people don't actually explore it and just kind of throw their hands up but meanwhile the fear is just breathing down their neck like a like a wolf that's constantly mm -hmm. you know sniffing the their artery of life but you know there's just in my own exploration and my own surrender to mm -hmm. death which the ceremonies have forced me to do and also the car accidents and different brushes that i've had with death there's uh there's it's not what people think no in the slightest you know and there's and when you really start to understand that death isn't something that is quite so scary mm -hmm. so yeah i mean if you want to just go into you know your understanding with the best of your capability of what is what happens when we yeah die. i mean i can share what i've learned and, and i have put you know potentially thousands of hours of study with many mystics and people like steiner and you know a lot because it's it's been an interest of mine for a long time because well because i want to know what god is and once you if you really want to know what god is until you really get clear on what that is you can never understand death or life mm. because it's it's the first principle from which our sense of self soul you can't have a soul if god doesn't have consciousness if god's not conscious then how could you be conscious if god is prime source then there's no quality that can exist anywhere in the universe that doesn't already exist in god because it's just impossible right right so for for my understanding of all this stuff and having dialogued and debated and talked about this with people all over the world i find that people's views of death are almost always a perfect reflection of their beliefs about god and what are most people's belief god loves you but he'll burn you in hell for touching your genitals and you'll be in there for a long time and you'll be getting hit with pitchforks and all this other shit and that's going to be worse than death and it's purgatory in the catholic sense and so you see well fuck no wonder people are scared as fucking hell of death like most people's conception of what happens when you die and how many people can say i haven't sinned 
and look themselves in the mirror and say that and you know and whatever else it's just like there's too much baggage around death and it, it's been so even to this fucking day with covid death is the ultimate leverage to get people to be afraid enough to do what you want them to do mm. right so death is like the ultimate tool for leveraging people until you get somebody like a Zen Buddhist monk who, who can shut his own heart off at will and Yogananda who could shut his own heart off at will and die at will. Yogananda said, death is like having a thousand orgasms at once. <laughs> and I would agree. Sounds like 5-MEO. It does. Uh, yeah. Because the death experiences that I've had, aside from a couple of them where I was just so... What was, what was the scary part was that I felt an obligation to my family right and i didn't want to leave them with a lot of load that really is my obligation to handle and this feeling of having a purpose and knowing that there's work yet undone yes that's when i look at when i look at death because i don't have a uh, children or anything i look and i'd be like that would be a damn shame because i'm just fucking getting started exactly <laughs> you know like and, that and, i'm and not done damn it i've always I've been learning a, my whole life and i got shit to yes, do yes i've always had a sense of mission since i was 21 things just the stars lined up and i knew why i was here and then through things like past life regressions with regression therapists and um doing my own inner work and talking to my soul about these things I'm very, very clear why I'm here, and I know exactly what I'm here to do. So when I get into a situation, be it through plant medicines or any other experience, I'm not ready to go yet. So a lot of the challenge that I have when I get into these situations isn't because I'm afraid to die, it's because I'm afraid to die at that moment. Right. But the one of the biggest things I think stops people, uh, leaves people in so much fear of death is that they have not lived yet right i've lived Correct. i i've ridden sexed <laughs> drugged climbed <laughs> crawled soldiered daddied i mean I, I in 59 years of life man i have studied hard worked hard played hard i have not been afraid to explore my sexuality i haven't like i have not left many stones unturned okay so when I like, if it wasn't for my kids, I say, fuck, get me Zeus anytime. Here I am. Hit me with a million volts and take me home, baby. <laughs> but, you know, because I, I need out of compassion for the people in the world that don't understand the kind of simple things we're talking about before you go get a bunch of shit stuffed in your head because you got tinnitus, try drinking some quality water for about three days, you know? Like the world is so railroad with all this medical fear, right? Yeah. And leveraging people and false marketing and manipulation that I feel a deep commitment to the rest of myself, the rest of the people in the world that aren't fortunate enough to have the life path and the experience and the knowledge and the discipline to study that I do. So... Steiner says when you die, the first thing that happens is you find yourself bouncing around the universe at the speed of thought until you realize it's you doing the thinking. So what he's saying is when your body's gone, there's nothing to anchor your mind. So until you learn to control your mind, death is a real ball buster because it takes a while for that energy to diffuse. Now, then there's a whole bunch of stuff he teaches with planets and cycles and where you go at different stages and you know he he attributes different types of what they would attribute to the bardo and the different stages we go through he talks about in relationship more of an alchemical approach to your you will go here first the moon then you'll go here then you'll go here and in each stage you go through a different experience a different level of awakening processing and realization and then the if i remember right in steiner's model once you are to the point where you don't need to live anymore or you've reached a level of spiritual development where your soul is quite pure, then you end up on the sun. And then if you want to reincarnate from there, you come back into the earth plane. Now it's been years. There's a great book called At Home in the Universe by Rudolf Steiner, which goes through his whole model of what happens when you die. 
And there's another great book that I give to people all the time. Um, I think it's called A Guide for the Recently Deceased by, I believe it's David Taub. I haven't read it for many years, but it's, a, it's such a great book. I give it to anybody who's got a death approaching in the family. But so Steiner has a model that's based on the Rosicrucian model, which is a you know elite group of Christians, um, mystic Christians. And then you've got the Tibetan book of the dead and you got the egyptian books and you you know there's all sorts of models and there's some parallels and there's some not um what i did which there's many other things i could say but just to kind of keep it from wandering everywhere what i did is i asked fundamental questions like what are we well it turns out everything in the universe is made of two things energy and information and I never forget the day that I heard Stephen Hawking in a lecture say, only two things can escape a black hole, energy and information. And I said, well, about the worst thing you could do to someone would be to throw them into a black hole based on the old model of a black hole. But, it, but really what we are is energy and information. Mm. So even the truth of us can't die in a black hole, which is the biggest death force ever found in the universe. Now, new models are showing slightly different things, but I won't segue us into all that, but it'll be a long discussion. Fun one, though. <laughs> um, there's a great book, by the way, if you really want to read about some good black hole shit. It's called <laughs> um, Punk Science Inside the Ma Mind of God by Mangir Samantha Lawton, and it's freaking good. Cool. Yeah. So... Well, then I say, okay, this body of mine is certainly not all I am. It keeps changing constantly. I mean, every day you look in the mirror, you get the idea that that's Aubrey, but the fact of the matter is your body's really more like a water fountain. I tell people, have you ever gone to a park and seen like a 30-foot water fountain from about 400 meters away? And it looks like a tree of ice, doesn't it? It doesn't even look like it's moving. You just see this white tree standing there. But as you approach, all of a sudden you can see that it's moving. Well, we're moving like a water fountain all the time. We're bringing in new tissue, new cells, fluids, and out with the old, and it's skin sloughing off and bones turning over. You turn over 10, 2 million red blood cells a second. You turn your bone cells over about every three weeks. You turn your epidermis over every three days. I mean, I've studied this. The body's got a cycle of turning over. So here's the deeper truth. You're fucking dying all the time. Yeah, and if this is the truth of who we are, the tr what's true is always true, and if that it's it's always changing. So and death this is a feeds life, thing. right? You can't have life without death. That's why I tell people who are vegetarians, don't be so worried about killing the chicken. What's more important is um, bringing the chicken into you as a sacrifice and as a practice of worship, knowing that that chicken is sustaining you. So what was a chicken 20 minutes ago now is upgraded to the level of human and to the degree that you invite the consciousness of that chicken into you, it is not dead. And to the degree that you honor and worship that chicken is giving you the ability to make the world a better place for all living beings now and in the future, the chicken has just upgraded its capacity for service, not only for its own species, but all species and for humanity, which are the most destructive of all. So really, that's reincarnation with soul added to it. It's and what are we if we're if we're a soul, which we are? Then when we bring something else into us, we're bringing all of it into us. So the soul, like, why do you think they call alcohol spirits? Because you're drinking the spirit of the fucking planet. It can change the way you see and feel everything. Mm. You eat the right cactus. You eat some, drink some ayahuasca. It's called vine of the soul, which means vine of death, interestingly. Mm. But you're bringing the soul of that plant in you. Now, to be a bit technical, what you're bringing in is the vibration of that organism and the vibration of the molecules that create the organism and the geometrical structures that they come in. But those are actually antenna systems that are in frequency lock with the soul, which is in a non-local domain, which Rupert Sheldrake would refer to as the morphic field. So you could say that's really where the, the essence 
is stored, but it's non-local, which means it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. It's not in a place. So what I'm saying is that as a soul, and we have to be careful about just thinking of soul because soul has no meaning without spirit. So the way I define what a soul is for people, I use an ancient symbol of the soul, which is a circle with a dot right smack dab in the middle. The, and this, interestingly, is exactly how a black hole functions. It pulls things into it and it pushes them out of a jet in the center. And all the way back in the 70s, Itzhak Bentov, who wrote Stalking the Wild Pendulum, A Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness, and one other book, said all black holes are coupled with white holes. They are a force of death that gives birth to life constantly. And only now are they starting to explore this with black hole science. And Samantha Lawton talks about this very beautifully in her book. So if you look at that picture, the positive or the, the dot, which is a point, which by definition geometrically has no dimension, like a photon has no mass, that point has no dimension until you create a plane. Now you've got a dimension. If you create another plane, you've got another dimension, right? So when you have a point in the middle of a sphere, Steiner said a soul exists in anywhere where there's an inside and an outside, including an atom. Anything that has shape or form has, have, has to have a means of regulating itself so it doesn't just dissolve into um, entropy, mm -hmm. right? So the soul is the intelligence that maintains the shape or the form. And if you look at Bentov's writing, he calls the soul of a bottle a diva or the soul of the table a diva. And this is many of the ancient philosophies had this, even aspects of paganism. Right, real animist philosophy. Yes, it's an animist philosophy. So the point is, you have the point in the middle, which is the emergence of something. Right? If you start a drawing, I give you an empty canvas. The instant your brush touches that canvas, you've got a point. And mm -hmm. from there, the whole thing begins. So there's the emergence. That's the principle of Yang. Or in David Bohm's model, that's the beginning of the explicate. But if you have a circle with no dot in it, then everything is enfolded. It's invisible, but it's there. So that's the implicate order. Yeah, pure potential. So when you put the dot in the middle, to represent the positive, now you have a body, Aubrey, you now have a field. And by definitions in science and physics, a field is a place of action. So the soul is responsible the, for the flow of energy and information, and the soul is what's experiencing it all. So thinking is spirit, and feeling what you're thinking and how you respond to your thoughts is soul how you feel about your friend's tinnitus or your mother's cancer or your divorce, that's the domain of soul. But when you're having feelings, you're also thinking about them. So spirit and soul are like the heads and the tails of a coin. You take the heads off of a coin, it's got no purchase power. You take tails off a coin, it's got no purchase power. But if you don't have something between heads and tails that's completely neutral, unconditional love or God, then those two collapse into each other and you've got no purchase power. So what makes the soul a dynamic principle of life is the fact that it has the feminine and the masculine. And the circle is a sphere which represents geometrically wholeness and it is also a symbol for God. And if you say, what is death? Well, look at this. If you have a circle and I ask you, where does it begin and where does it end? You can't answer that. Okay, But if you take the circle, split it in half, and draw it as a sine wave, you can call this life, the positive, and this negative, death. And you can worship those as separate, but what you've just done is name two halves of a circle and created mm -hmm. the illusion that the well, circle and, is broken. And, and truncated an infinite sine wave of life and death and well, cycle. And, and, and the truth of it is, is because God is wholeness, it's an infinity symbol. You're only aware of what's happening in life, <laughs> but you are not aware of all the parts of you dying every second that we talked about. Right. And when you're dead, you're not aware that you're actually just as alive as you ever were, 
until you awaken to the fact, and that's what spiritual practice is for, Steiner says very specifically, the function of spiritual practice is to develop the subtle body copies of each of your glands and organs that create consciousness in your physical body, in your light body. So it's only through working to see what's seeing. Right? Aubrey's looking at me right now, but the question is, who's actually seeing what he's seeing? Aubrey's hearing me right now, but who's actually listening to the vibrations inside of his ear? You get the point? Mm. Like you're hearing me, but you can be hearing from a physical level and think, I hear Paul. But I say, Aubrey, who's actually listening in there? Is it, is it the ultimate listener, the capital L listener, the yes. capital A awareness? The who's unborn, actually the feeling? Undying. Yep. Who's tasting, right? right? And so what you see, like I'm clairvoyant. So if I want to, I can go into what's called second sight or shift my perception and read your energy field. But I don't walk around doing that because I have to look at everybody's dirty laundry and, and, the, and, and then I have to sit there and be amazed with all the things. So I actually just use that when I'm trying to help somebody or investigate something. But what Steiner was teaching and what many of the mystics teach is that when you meditate deeply on a topic like death, you might start having images. When we question deeply, what's happening when I dream? How is that happening? And we, most people I know have had dreams that were so real that when they woke up, it seemed less real than the intensity of the dream they were just having. And some of them were dreaming that they were dying and they were scared to death and woke up freaking sweating from head to toe. And others have dreams so real that they orgasm in their dream. Now, if you can orgasm in a dream, if you can keep doing that, it's a lot cheaper than <laughs> marriage. <laughs> but the point I'm making is, is the person in the dream alive or dead? That's the, it's in that, inter, it's kind of in that interstitial place where people don't know. Right. Because people, people associate the body with life. Right. And the consciousness with a byproduct of life that's somewhere non-local, but some people f fix it to the brain, so they right. would say it's life. Some people say, no, 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 this is part of the consciousness, it's part of the non-local that always exists. Mm -hmm. So, But dreams are kind of somewhere in that, uh, in that middle, middle range for okay. most people. Okay, and how many times have you been in a deep medicine ceremony where you're having experiences that are so damn vivid, so intensely real, that when you come out of it, it feels like this is actually more the sleepy realm. Oh, many times. And that's where my own understanding of, of death has come from. You yeah. know, it comes from the place of truth, the, the gnosis, the knowing yeah. of having traversed. So my death, I don't know if I ever told you about this, but I had a actually a non-plant medicine derived death experience where I was actually lying in between um, two people actually <laughs> interestingly one of them is my wife but we were at burning man and we were just resting they were they were on strong uh psilocybin at the time i was sober i was my rest day and they were you know journeying deeply and i was lying between them and it was like two poles of a battery and i was in the middle and i journeyed to a place that i knew was the death realm mm -hmm. and in the death realm everything was just pure black potentiality it was in this absolute void in the darkness mm -hmm. <clears throat> but every thought that i had would appear to me i didn't have to try there was no traveling it just mm -hmm. instantly manifested mm -hmm. so if i had a thought it would instantly manifest if i wanted to talk to someone's soul it would instantly manifest that's and there exactly, we had a vivid discussion by the way that's exactly the characteristics of the astral realm and that's right. the first place you go when you die right and so interesting i was there and it was this beautiful experience but i also felt that there was a second death and, I, and i've called it that mm -hmm. and the second death was to dissolve completely so the recognition of self the one who was talking because i still was me i was still talking to the souls there i was still choosing with my own will what images i wanted to perceive if i wanted to see a rainbow over a waterfall i could mm -hmm. see it and it would be beautiful and vivid if i wanted to talk i was i had choice and i had personality mm -hmm. and i had a lot of things but there was this calling and i could feel it mm -hmm. and it was like you could let this all go yes. and go back to the unicity 
as the second death. And maybe there's multiple deaths in between those well, two. I'll, I'll get into that when, when you're ready. But uh, I've been in that very place where God has said to me, I, I've, I've said, I'm afraid to die right now. I don't want to leave my family. You know, the things I told you about and the voice that I'll call God that speaks to me from every direction simultaneously. So it's not a human voice. It's beyond your mind can't wrap your head around it till you had this experience, but it's as though space itself is speaking. God always has said to me the same thing. I should be getting used to it by now. <laughs> if you trust me, you must let go. If you cannot trust me, then I am in service to you. Whatever you would like is my my wish i will support you if you want to live i will support you but if you want to die then you must trust me and i'm saying like yes but i w will i get back home and the answer is you must trust me <laughs> not yes or no and so um unless in, in some experiences where we just loaded the cannon up enough with dmt for example that there is no time for that you know you get enough dmt in you there's no mental dialogue it's one two three god like it or not <laughs> and so that's one of the way you know you got to have billy goat balls for that kind of thing one two three god like it or not yeah and i've, I've done MEO, DMT i've probably in a done nutshell. 80 of those in my yeah. career and and every one of them i tell people because i only do that with people like kyle or someone who's strong enough to handle that experience because i've i've actually seen people go through a psychotic episode that can last for a year or more mm. because the shock of it and the fear of it is so great it causes soul loss and they and they actually now i don't do that to people but i've been with shaman that do do that and they say well that's just your karma and then i've ended up having to be the therapist for a lot of these people to put the pieces back together so the point I'm making is I, if I'm going to do a ceremony with that intention, inevitably one or two of my friends will say, oh, I want to go, I want to go. And I'm like, you're not ready for something like this. Mm -hmm. You know, you just mm -hmm. trust me, you're not ready for this. But there are a couple people out there that I've done this with that are ready and you can hear the sound of us flying through the fucking universe at the speed of now. And... um on those experiences, I'm just simply saying, you've got to go into them ready to die. And so I have said to my wife, both both of them, but I haven't been doing those intense types because I've had so many of them, I realized, okay, I've got the information I need. I don't need to keep testing God right. and taunting God. It's not a good idea. But I have told Penny, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, honey, but I've, I've got research I got to do on God and death. And should I not come home, Feel free to write my will however you want, or you know, do whatever you want with the okay. institute, or make sure Paul Jr. gets this much or that much. But I've had that conversation with her a number of times because honestly, I do go to the point where I don't know if I'm going to come back. And that's the proper level of respect for any of these things. And yes, I think a lot of people do them tri with this kind of flippant triviality, but it's, it's not that. It's, no, it's, it's disrespectful to the to the whole, not only to the medicines and the spirits that that give us the gifts of awakening but it's disrespectful to the entire healing and shamanic tradition sure and i believe you know i believe you always get yourself back so people that behave that way if, if you think of love as a boomerang whatever you put out comes back so if you're disrespectful to that you're probably disrespectful to a lot of people and a lot of beings in the world and it's just not an intelligent way to go because when you go that deep into god you're going to confront yourself with great intensity and that's a side note when you when you die you come face to face with you the whole christian right. idea of judgment and some elaborate fucking story of angels weighing you and seeing if you the egyptian story now i get them as metaphors i know what they mean because i've studied a lot of these things like the i think it's isis will weigh your heart against a feather and if you're heavier than the feather you can't move on to the higher planes and, and, and but but we do that ourselves is what i'm saying yeah god does god does judge you and that god is you it is you judges yourself because there is really no paradoxically there is no other god than you and 
this goes to the same paradox as if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make any noise? Well, you can jump around that one all day long, and many people do, but the reality of it is you're a point of consciousness in the divine. I'm a point of consciousness in the divine, and it's only because I'm conscious and you're conscious that we can share this relationship with each other. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then it's only because I'm conscious that I can even be conscious of God as a possibility. And therefore, if God is the source of consciousness, it's only because I'm consciousness that I'm aware of that. Therefore, if I'm not here, I'm not conscious, then death doesn't mean anything, neither does life and neither does God. Does that make sense? Yep. You, 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 if you're here and you're alive and you're conscious, then you're a point. And if one of the definitions I think I've shared with you before of God is God is a sphere whose circumference is everywhere and, excuse me, a sphere whose circumference is nowhere and a center whose presence is everywhere. So if you are a sphere whose circumference is nowhere and a center of consciousness that is everywhere, it means if you are conscious, then you're a center of consciousness. And if that did not exist, then nothing else could exist either. Because if the tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make any noise? It's the same paradox, isn't it? Mm. So really all I'm saying is think of consciousness as light. Think of everything in existence that's not light as dark. If you have no light, you wouldn't know what darkness was, like a fish doesn't know it's in water, and you wouldn't be able to see anything anyhow. So if you think of the spirit soul as a light that sees unto itself, then ultimately at the end of the day, if that light isn't there, there is nothing to be known. Now you could still be alive and believe in God, but that's that doesn't help me at all. You understand? Right. Like if if Aubrey dies, I still stay alive, let's say. But if Paul dies, Aubrey still stays alive. So my sense of what's happening at any phase of life or death, as we're talking about, depends upon a locus of consciousness, and that's what a soul is. A soul is a locus of consciousness, and the flow of energy and information through that locus is spirit. And without that combination, which happens to be the prerequisite for all existence, none of us could be aware of anything. So here's, here's a question that I've had. <clears throat> so we think of the brain as the computer that stores memory, that stores information, right? People do, I don't. Be right. So this is, a, this is a, you know, the idea that's out there in the zeitgeist is that the brain is the place that stores information. Although we've presumably traveled to places the astral dimension celestial dimension whatever you want to call them places where you are no longer in the physicality in the physical 3d I'm a remote world viewer i do it all the time right so but in those places there still seems to be the access to the memories to every all of the storage of information as you said life is information and energy but yeah. there's still access to information how is that information still stored in the spirit soul in the absence of a brain, as the brain is deteriorating in back into carbon and minerals and the worms are you know, returning it to soil, what is the mechanism in, in your best estimation of how information is stored without a local storage bank? Okay. Um, first of all, the body and everything in it are a product of the creative forces of the soul itself. But the soul and the spirit that is Aubrey cannot be separate from all the souls and spirits that have informed him. And one of the things that you find is that when you go through a death experience or you practice them or you investigate them is that at every level of our experience, when we die, we come into contact with other souls that are at that level of existence. So, for example, when you die a physical death, you will be consciously born into the astral realm and you will meet souls. And this is why one of the most consistent things you hear about near-death experiences or people that were with someone as they were dying, they say, 
oh my God, my mother. And they're talking about people that have already right. passed on and they're there to meet them. Okay. Because souls move in groups. That's another long discussion. Soul but my, pods. Yeah. So I call them groups. And so what I'm pointing out is that who Aubrey is right now is not just Aubrey. Aubrey's not only got all of his soul family inside of him, talking to him, expressing life through him as him, but then we have to say, well, who influenced them and who influenced them? So you get into this very interesting experience. It's everybody in the universe. So Aubrey turns out to be a unique expression that we all called into existence together because some part of the collective consciousness that we will call God, which includes us, has something that it wants to experience of itself that needs a unit of individuality and novelty. And that's why we only exist as this form one time. No Paul Check will ever be on this planet with these fingerprints ever again, nor will it occur in the universe. Neither will uh, this set of fingerprints we know of as Aubrey's. So what I'm saying is, is that, first of all, what we are is not just a single entity. It is a, an amalgamation of the whole, because everything begins from God, and therefore everything is God, and everything is what it is, because it's aware of itself at some level, and that awareness is ubiquitous, because what is witnessing behind your ego and your sense of self is the same awareness that's looking through my eyes, mm -hmm. Okay. So the first point I'm addressing is that your body is actually not something that encapsulates who you really are. Your body is something that you created to fit into this domain that has the right dimensions, the right characteristics, qualities, size, organ types, nerve types. You chose the gene line you chose specifically to give you the antenna system you needed to interact with the frequency domains in which your novelty was required as part of the art, dance, or play of God. Yep. Okay. Why that's an important predistinction is because your brain is actually not a locus of consciousness. It's a limiter of consciousness. Mm. It is a filtration system. That's what Huxley talked about in Doors of Perception. And, and it's like Bentov also uses the definition of a television set. He says, just because you kill the television set does not mean that the television frequency is gone because anybody with a television set can tune into it. And that wave is everywhere simultaneously. So your brain is really a sending and receiving station and it's linked to all your chakras. So it turns out, what, what is your brain? It's a collection of neurons that feed your whole body. In fact, brain embryologically grows out of the same tissue that your skin does, and your skin is the sensory pole of the brain. So you're actually wrapped in brain tissue. In actual fact, the inside of your head brain has no sensory neurons. You can cut it open and eat it, and you wouldn't even feel a thing. So what we think of as the brain actually is just something that we call the brain, but it's actually integrated with every part of the body. And it's just a central locus where information flows so that decisions can be made without going into a bunch of brain science. I'm only making the point you, you turn the channel on the television. You got a completely different world, right? Completely different movie. You can go from bad news to good news. You can go from sad movie to action to goopy love story. Mm -hmm. So the brain's actually limiting. It's actually designed like an antenna. And the antenna that works on a uh, cell phone is not the same as the antenna that works on a television is not the same that works on a shortwave radio because the antenna has to be constructed so that it can capture the specific frequencies it's designed to tune into by geometry. You know, that's yeah. the mechanics of an antenna. So all bodies are antennas and an, a, a wolf's experience of itself is specific to the wolf because its body shape, its body structure and its brain and nervous system are tapping into all the frequency bundle that creates wolfness. And if you took the wolf's 
consciousness and put it into a bear, it wouldn't be a wolf anymore. It would be a bear because it would be in a bear body. And it would, it, if it remembered being a wolf, it would say, wow, I've got all these other ideas now. Like I didn't used to want huckleberries, but I got this big thing for huckleberries all of a sudden. And salmon, I got this f burning need for salmon. So what we really are is a non-local projection and the brain just happens to be the receiving station that allows us to have the experience of separation from our soul group and separation from the whole, which allows love to have much more specific currency because you perceive yourself as an individual. I perceive myself as an individual. And because of that, you can become the object of my devotion. But if I was actually looking at you and seeing everything that ultimately made you up, at the subatomic level, or we say the non-local level, I would be looking at a sea of beings that goes so far it would just become an ocean, and I would find myself swimming in the same fucking ocean going, oh my God, me and Aubrey are actually the same person. Right. Pretending that to be different so we can experience love together. So what am I saying? What we call mind is actually a dimension of energy and information that does not require a body, but is something that expresses itself in and through a body. But that doesn't mean that another soul that's evolved out of a body cannot meet and greet Aubrey in the dimension of the astral or the mental or the higher mental and not meet his body because Aubrey's just as real at that dim those dimensions and when we practice things like remote viewing and astral travel, we come to be aware of all sorts of stuff that can be verified through our own experience and realize, wow, this limited perception of who I am as a body was very, very tricky and deceptive. But now that I know the truth of myself, I know that I'm actually alive on all these other dimensions and I'm currently invested in this role because I'm here to learn, express, and experience unique things that we find out later turn out to be a contribution to the whole. Yeah. When, 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 if you die tomorrow and we all get everyone that knows Aubrey together and say, what did Aubrey add to your life? I would have a very long list of things from a very large number of people because it would have to include, <laughs> include every person that ever listened to one of your podcasts, everyone that ever read one of your book, wore any of your clothes. You see, you're going to have a very large number of people. Then we say, okay, now how did that way of learning and relating from Aubrey affect your wife, your husband, your kids, your grandparents, your friends? And guess what happens? Pretty soon the whole fucking globe is lit up with Aubrey. <laughs> <laughs> so then you have to say, well, who was he? <clears throat> He was all of us. Who is he? He's all of us. Where did he go? Everywhere. Where did he come from? Nowhere. <laughs> Where's he at now? Everywhere. That's such a beautiful way to, way to look at things. And then to understand that there's just those levels of individuation and articulation in yep. between the everywhere and nowhere. Yes. And so as I've been articulated as an Aubrey, according to the primordial Aubrey source, which has been there. The divine urge. Yep. Yeah. And then as I'm choosing and growing and expressing as Aubrey, I'm informing in a bilateral path as my soul is informing me, I'm informing my soul, which is the primacy of the urge to learn yes. and experience is this bilateral, this is where both me physically and my soul, we're all learning together in, in And conjunction. to take it one fundamental step further, all of it is because God cannot know itself without looking into itself because God, by definition, is that for which there is no other. Therefore, the only way God can have an experience is to look into itself. In the instant that God looks into any part of itself, consciousness enlivens what was once implicate, a seed or a potential, and it becomes active in the now. And to the degree that God wants to experience itself as Aubrey Marcus, that consciousness begins to interact with the rest of God because that's what makes love work. And therefore, if there was nobody here but Aubrey, Aubrey could not have an experience because Aubrey would now be trapped in the same situation. God is going, well, what the fuck? I'm in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's the worst place ever. It's the void. It's, it's the, the void. It's the place that you were talking about earlier. So 
the the point I'm driving at here is that all of us are God experiencing itself, and that's why evil is as important to God as good, because God could not possibly know itself if it only looked into the good of itself or the light of itself. It has to look into the darkness with equal honesty, and paradoxically, you cannot have consciousness without those two diametrically complementary they, they're diametrically opposed in their extremes, you know, a saint versus a murderer. But in actuality, they're just complementaries of each other. And as hard as it is for people with immature spiritual and religious beliefs to understand, someone like uh, Adolf Hitler or an axe murderer or a public shooter is actually as divine and as much in service to God because God has got to know its own potentials and it has absolutely no fear of dying. In fact, in a meditation a few months ago on medicines, I, which I do a lot because those two go really well together, <laughs> and I, I, I ask questions, God, because on certain medicines, my clairvoyance is wickedly enhanced, so like I can see thoughts like forms instantly. <clears throat> I said to God, via my soul, I said, I have a question for God. God, are you listening? And then I got a yes. I said, now God knows what, what's the prerequisite of the question is because people keep trying to destroy themselves. They torture themselves with bad food, all the things we were talking about, right? Sure. People are so, so busy not living, they forget to live and then they die wishing they'd lived, right? So I said, God, why do you keep trying to destroy yourself? <laughs> you know what God said back? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, holy fuck, I get it. What God was saying to me is, don't worry about that. Those are all the experiences I need to have to know myself. I need to try everything. I need to be depressed. I need to be beaten, raped, pillaged, loved, saint, sage, guru, dipshit, mass fucking murderer, <laughs> uh, crippled, I cannot know myself, and don't worry about that, Paul. I can't die. I cannot destroy myself. What you're looking at and calling me is actually my creations. And yes, I'm invested in them and I enliven them, but the truth is all that dissolves is the form that I've imagined and enlivened. Right. But it's nothing more than my imagination. And what you call real, because it's materialized, is nothing but entangled light. It's the intensity of my dream. And I dream nothing into something. And that's what I do. That's how I come to know myself. So God was saying, don't worry about it. Yes, be in service to these people, because that's your role. And yes, I love it when you come help me. Because it feels good. I feel loved. Right. But don't worry about those people. All of them will know the truth of themselves when they die. And I have actually done remote viewing and asked my soul to take me into the experience of people dying. And I've watched people dying in the most amazing experiences is when some executive that's making lots of money like a CEO who has not spent nearly enough time with his wife and kids, feels tremendous remorse and, and guilt for it, but is addicted to making money and being this high-powered dude, when he dies of high blood pressure or coronary artery disease, and he realizes that he's still alive and has the conversation with God or the angels, however you want to put it, usually they crack up laughing but they cry their eyes out with equal intensity they go oh my god this was so funny i thought i was gonna die i thought this was i was losing everything i thought i was sinning and god says oh no wasn't that fucking fun i mean god didn't say fuck but god says wasn't that, that fun wasn't that an did. amazing experience <laughs> and guess what they'll all see you when they pass over too and your death was an important part of their experience. And if you try to change it, you will actually change who your children and who your friends are meant to become. 
you are as important to them as they are to you. And the choices we make as individuals is our co-creative freedom to be a creator with God. Choosing to eat well and live well is our co-creative choice. Choosing to deny the body, destroy the body, ignore the body, God says, yes, let's do it. That's the, <clears throat> and therein lies the, the paradox because that could get you to a point where uh, almost a point of nihilism where nothing matters, right? If you wanted to take it that way, and I don't believe that's the way you, you, you know, no. you take it. It's, it's, it's because really there's certain things that in this physical body and in this mind feel a lot better. It feels a lot better to be free. Yes. It feels a lot better to be in love. And when you have compassion, when you do care about others, you can make that choice to actually expand and grow the amount of freedom, joy, love that people yes. experience because it's just kind. It's yes. kindness. And any nihilist is really making an admittance to the rest of us that they have not focused on the depth and the beauty and the quality and the capacity of love. Mm -hmm. because anyone that truly pays attention to what love does to any living being and even non-living beings if you're a shaman for example a shaman can put tremendous love into a crystal and it can become a very powerful healing tool because it's imbued with the spirit and the love of that shaman and i do this myself and this is part of real magic not m-a-g-i-c but m-a-g-i-c-k healing magic amulets for example no one is a nihilist if they're equally committed to exploring love. Because when you really explore love, you explore and experience the depth of why God creates the illusion of separation. Because ultimately, God is as alone as alone gets. By definition, God is that for which there is no other. Mm. The intensity of God's aloneness is what creates God's dreaming of everything into existence. And what is the worst thing you can do to a human being? Put them in solitary confinement. What do they usually do within about 72 hours? Start creating imaginary friends. Otherwise, there's no reason to live and they will either commit suicide or die of loneliness. So God does exactly what we do. Yeah, and God's isolation. The longing, experience the longing and the experience of another. God love. dreams other into existence. Right. And that dreaming of other into existence is the prerequisite for love because you have to have an object of devotion or love has no currency, which is why in previous shows with you, I've defined love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other. Love is also consciousness becoming aware of itself. And if God's not consciousness, then God really isn't anything because without consciousness, you can't be aware of anything. It makes God a useless principle to begin with. <clears throat> all right, we're back from the most interesting intermission smoke break <laughs> of all time. We talked about the essence of dragons, all kinds of things. I want to summarize a little bit of what we were saying from a, from a Rumi quote, uh, a poet that we're both in love with. Mm. Everyone is so afraid of death. But the real Sufis just laugh. Nothing tyrannizes their hearts. What strikes the oyster shell does not damage the pearl. Nope. And that's the thing, you know, as we look out in this world, you know, people don't understand that they're the pearl. They think that they're the oyster shell. They think mm -hmm. they're the skin, the ego, mm -hmm. all of these aspects. They're playing the finite game, trying to build their titles, mm -hmm. trying to build everything in this quest for immortality, the immortality being the memory of who they are in this very limited scope, not understanding they're already always immortal. They can't be anything but immortal because they're the divine. Yes. And that's the pearl. And so that's why when you realize that, it's time to play it's time to laugh it's time to love it's time to everything you mentioned fuck and feast and and you know play pranks on somebody and smile about it and play yeah. basketball and do whatever the fuck you know be a feels loving good. devil it's, that's right that's right an angel an angel with your devil's horns acknowledging both and yeah. and playing the game so that everybody can continue to play rather than trying to restrict play and end the game and for being, everybody and being honest enough to remember the truth of what you just said when you're on the sharp end of the devil's point horn right. meaning the devil comes to play you a little game with you too whether it being someone ripping you off or 
you know, whatever it could be, right? Getting hit blindsided in a car by a drunk driver. It, it takes real spiritual courage to be able to carry that intellectual concept into what we would call reality. But, you know, I wrote a note there while you were talking because there's something about this whole issue of so many people being stuck as the oyster shell and the guts of the thing, not realizing that they're the pearl, which is really the soul. And that is that if you look in some philosophical and metaphysical systems, they describe that what we call evil is actually the forces that hold form together. So they're responsible for holding the planets and the stars and the moons and the houses and the cars and the watches and the tables and the chairs together. Why that's so important is that you cannot have consciousness without limitation. By definition, God is unconditional love. How can you have an experience of or relate to something that's unconditional? I'm talking to you, that's a condition. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you're picking up in a telepath telepathic communication, that's a condition. There's energy flowing into you somehow, some way. So, and it's also bound by time as well. Like and as, soon as, as soon as you make form, you make time. As soon as you have relationship, you have time. Right. Okay. So the, whenever you have love until it becomes unconditional, you have form, three requisites of consciousness, according to Itzhak Bentov, are space, movement, and time. So if you create something, you already have to have space. And whatever it's created out of is moving. An atom is moving at just under the speed of light. Even photons are moving at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So you have to have sp uh, space, time, and movement. And thought is movement. Thoughts move. They have beginnings, middles, and ends, okay? So the principle that I'm driving at is that the principle of limitation is absolutely essential to consciousness because without me defining where Aubrey ends and where Paul begins, I couldn't have a relationship with Aubrey. How would you know where your house was if there wasn't a limitation on your yard and the structure of your house or which car would be yours? If they all turned into a puddle of water, we would never find our car. There wouldn't be enough limitation. So the, the problem is, is that a lot of people don't honor the fact that the thing we call death creates an impossibility wall. It creates the illusion of being the end. It creates a limitation. And without the limitation, people are less likely to take life seriously. And it is through confronting the illusion of limitation, because if God is unconditional love, then, it, then limitation must be an illusion that has a function, and the function is consciousness. The function is form, the function is relationship, and the function is love. So when we learn that, you know, for example, if you, were, if you went to the Olympics and some sprinter showed up looking like a centipede and had 50 legs, well, it would probably be pretty hard to outrun somebody that that had 50 legs that could move as fast as the guy with two legs because his stride would be quite long as just as a working metaphor. Mm -hmm. So limitation actually is something that's fundamentally critical to relationship in every level because you cannot have consciousness of anything without limitation. Look at our language. It's 26 symbols called the letters of the alphabet. Each of them has a limitation. And if we didn't have a limit, to the sound of A, before it began to be B, we would never have language or the ability to communicate. Or any poetry. And that's, this yeah. is where life becomes art. Like the limitation creates the art. There, is, is, the no, art. there is no art without limitation. And that's there, what color is. Yeah, how do you paint if you're painting with the all color? You know, how do you yeah. look at something if it's the all light? How do you yeah. listen to music if it's the all sound? How do you communicate or write poetry if it's the all letter? Yes, so limitation is actually one of the fundamental tools of creation within what we will call the mind of God. Because without limitation, there's no relationship, and without relationship, there's nothing to be conscious of. Death is ultimately a form of limitation, and I call it an impossibility wall 
So to clarify that in my PPS Success Mastery lessons on PPS Lesson 2, self-management, I show how the mind has worked, how it's brainwashed, how it's programmed, and how to use the science of brainwashing to un unbrainwash yourself. And brainwashing shouldn't be called brainwashing because it sounds like cleaning, but like programming. it's programming, right? So the I forgot what point I was about to make there, but uh, the, the real point I'm driving at is that um, – we have to have, oh, the impossibility wall. So remember back in the day, I don't know if you're uh, old enough to remember this, but it was believed and said by scientists that no human being could run faster than four minutes in the mile. They said it was physiologically impossible. Then Jim Fix ran, I think, 359 or something like that. I thought it was Prefontaine. It wasn't that guy? No, it was a guy. I think it was Jim Fix. But anyhow, whoever the first guy was, Something like 13 people broke the four-minute mile within the next year. And within the next couple of years, something like 57 people did it. So the point I'm making is we had a socially contrived, scientifically validated impossibility wall that people believe so thoroughly. Now, the question is how many athletes couldn't run faster than that because they believed it couldn't be done? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't beat my mom at tennis until I was so much better than her. That it was like it was ridiculous. She had to be like sixty years old, and I had to be in my absolute prime because I believed that I couldn't beat her because she right. was a great tennis player, and yes. like I had to get so much better. So it was almost, and I've seen that in my own sport. Like when there's a when there's a wall, yep, and then I have to get so far past the wall to cross the wall, yes, that it's like so. It's almost like to beat the four minute mile, you have to almost be ready to run a three forty. Yes. You know, just to even beat the four minute, if that four minute, the stronger mm -hmm. that is fixed in your mind. And that's how, that's how the limitations of the, of the mind really work. Yeah. Or you've got to be able to run a quarter mile slightly faster than four minute pace. And when you can do one, you got to train to run two. And when you can do two, you know, now look, I'm 75% of the way. My impossibility wall is close to going down. Yeah. So sometimes you got to take a project and chunk it into bite-sized pieces so that you can actually get real and see progress at a smaller level to inspire you to keep going. But really, what is the greatest impossibility wall creator of all? Fear. How much of that fear is false evidence appearing real? Most of it. How much of it is socially contrived and passed on to us by others who are in the habit of being fearful? And what percentage of us are truly pioneers that are brave enough to go where others are fear to go? Not, not everybody would be the first man on the moon. They would think immediately, I'm probably not coming back. And that would be their impossibility wall. How many, how many people actually live a life of almost poverty or lower moderate income because they have limiting beliefs about their ability to earn x number of dollars or even if they deserve it they have all these um program belief systems put into their head so you actually have no free will until you begin to investigate your own programming and heal anything that's creating a limitation on your freedom because until that unconscious programming is made conscious, you actually don't have free will. You're just a recapitulation of mom, dad, and whoever brainwashed you into believing the and, things you believe. Yeah, and as the, as the Toltec says, the metote, the marketplace of ideas that condition us constantly. And then you have these pioneers, like Wim Hof is a great example. <laughs> yeah. And his records of withstanding the yes. cold and actually changing the way that the body responds to cytokines from an injection of E. coli, scientifically yes. validated, all these so things. So he's breaking all these impossibility walls. Breaking all walls of now. these impossibility walls. And then somebody's like, oh, wow. But then some people were like, they, they'll fight for that impossibility wall. Say, so, oh, well, he's, a, he's an alien. He's not like all of us. And then he's just saying the same thing that Christ said, not that went off as Christ. Well, we're all Christ. But he's saying, no, 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 this is not just what I can do. This is what anybody can do. And I'm showing you the way. But people will be like, oh, no, 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 that's just him. Or like someone like Kwang Duk who self-immolated. And that was this moment where can you really hold meditation while flames are licking your robes and ripping apart your skin? Can you hold that? Because mm -hmm. your meditation and prayer is so strong. Yes. 
yes, you can, we all can, it's possible for all of us because we're all different articulations of the same source. And instead of alienating these individuals that are the pioneers and saying, oh, they're special, the person who creates that spontaneous remission of cancer, that person who you know accomplishes what Wim Hof has or what Kwang Duk could do, we can do that too. Absolutely, and I think Bill Gates may have gotten a little insecure of Wim Hof and said, okay, you think you can tear impossibility walls down? Then let me build one for you and see how well you do with it. We'll just call it COVID. <laughs> so you see the dick swinging going on. Of course, I'm yeah. making a joke of it, right? Right. But uh, there are people that have just as much fun building impossibility walls. And what is it? <laughs> you must choose Jesus as your savior. You're going to burn in hell, no matter what religion you are. And so when you ask, okay, what about someone who lived a beautiful life, loving, caring person, but never heard of Jesus in their entire life and is from a third world country where they don't even know what Jesus means, does that apply to them too? Well, a lot of unenlightened Christians would say, absolutely, that guy's going to burn in hell. Well, that makes for one dumbass God. It makes, and it doesn't for, it make makes Jesus, for a devil. It doesn't make Jesus very em empathetic and compassionate either. No. Right? So what it's I'm saying- demonic realm. One of the fastest ways to build an impossibility wall is to be ignorant and not be intelligent enough to ask, is this really true? The day you begin asking, is this really true? You go into the level that Steiner calls the awareness soul. When you actually authentically question whatever comes your way with healthy skepticism and only make a decision when you have adequate information on both sides of the impossibility wall, like COVID, is this really true? These people say it is, but these people are just as qualified and they say this is what's really going on. Okay, these people may be just as qualified that say COVID is really true, but what are they producing in the world? How do they practice medicine? Are they practicing allopathic medicine? Is it highly profitable? And oh, by the way, these people over here give their love and services away, help people that can't afford it, and are actually trying to free you from the medical system by using the technology of medicine. Well, these people are invested in keeping you in it. So only when you look at both sides of the impossibility wall, we'll call COVID, can you actually reach the level of awareness where you make an adult decision for yourself. And only then are you using your mind holistically and effectively and practicing real thinking, which is why David Bohm said, real thinking is hard work. That's why most people just rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking. But mm -hmm. most people's prejudices aren't even their own. They've been programmed into them by TV, churches, parents, yeah. and other unenlightened people that don't actually know how to think constructively. And our entire education system, with rare exception, is designed to teach you what to think but rarely ever teaches you how to, how think. to think. Yeah. So there's this is this is an interesting slight paradox that I'd like to explore. So for those of us who are going through this process, yeah. thinking, weighing, analyzing, <clears throat> understanding the mechanisms of fear that might be at play, that might be limiting thought, that might be restricting our openness to this, our own selfishness, our own way in which we see ourselves as the center of the universe rather than a player in the infinite game designed to keep it going. And I want to, you know, I've been mentioning finite and infinite games a little bit. I'm reading that now. It's, it's a, a beautiful book beautiful by James book, Cars. Man. Unbelievable. Great He's, guy for you to interview. <clears throat> he just passed. Oh, you're kidding me? Yeah, I believe that's I believe that's true. Can someone look that up? I have him scheduled for a podcast. Yeah, I believe he, Round I believe two. he just passed. Oh, I love that man. Yeah. Can someone confirm that? Oh um, my God, James, if you're gone, I'm here with you, buddy. I love you. Your life was so beautiful and you've touched me so deeply. And if you haven't passed yet, it's still true. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. Um, when did he die? Oh my God! Yeah, your your podcast was probably one of the last uh, last times we've got he, to hear him. In a did public you listen interview. to that? I did. It was unbelievable. Isn't he just the most gorgeous human being? He is. Almost ninety years old, lucid, mm -hmm. such a beautiful teacher. That's a man that I wanted to kiss. Mm -hmm. I really did. Yeah. He he really made my wings grow yeah i mean he contributed something to the world that very few 
people contribute just a, a radically beautiful idea that will last forever and his, his book, book yeah. the religious case against belief is excellent okay i have to check I've that read, one out too he's got about eight or ten books i've probably read four of them mm, awesome well, to go to uh, to go to the point, and as you said, you know, so much gratitude and, and love for for him where he's at for the pearl that is uh, that articulated as as James Cars. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about so we're in this world now where there's a lot of people who are just you know fear vaccinations, you know, this whole kind of paradigm that we're in, mm -hmm. and you know, James Cars in his book he says that. Uh, Evil is the termination of infinite play. Infinite players do not attempt to eliminate evil in others, for to do so is the very impulse of evil itself, and therefore a contradiction. The only attempt to paradoxically recognize they only attempt to paradoxically recognize in themselves the evil that takes form in attempting to eliminate evil elsewhere. So here to me is is a paradox because I think one of the things we want to do is help unrestrict people from the prisons that they're in and allow yeah. them to have this genuine free will beyond the programming yes. that they've had to make the choices He's they want to take. not against that. And I don't think he is. But nonetheless, there is a way in which we have to be both the infinite player that allows all to be, understanding that all is yes. God and all is perfect, but also the willingness to be the player that takes the choice to help people to see the reality as yes. it is. Yeah, the difference is what he's leaning towards there is if you go start telling people your mask is stupid what the fuck you doing don't you know any better now you're actually imposing upon their right to that belief and that orientation so in effect you're acting evil toward them correct because you're diminishing them for being who they are and having the beliefs that they have which is their sovereignty and their free will or calling them sheep for example, yes. any any kind of insult or anger or aggression towards yes, anyone. Yes, and I must ask Great Spirit for forgiveness because sometimes <laughs> I really get frustrated at all, you know. And I I border on being evil <laughs> and saying, "Wake up, goddamn it! Don't you realize this is a big fucking game, and you don't have to be caught in the loser's box all the time." <laughs> You know, the penalty box, because there is a penalty box for not waking up, right? Yeah. So you see, having studied James and, 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 and had time to have conversation with him and share emails with him and having a depth of knowledge to read the book and, and probably get more out of it than most people can, um, if we make an offering out of love to somebody, which is why I do podcasts, which is why I have almost 600 videos on YouTube, uh, you know, why I do things that I do for the public, write books, write articles, piles of stuff for free, thousands and thousands of hours of free work. That's my, that's bird seed I put out, mm -hmm. but I don't grab people and force their face into the bird seed and say, eat dumb shit. You got to wake up because you're making my life miserable because I got to look at you doing this stupid shit to yourself all day. Now, think of when you're in a family and you're watching somebody in your family do stuff to themselves. Like my brother was a drug addict. It was hard to watch. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to divulge too much about my family, but let's just say there's been many instances in my own family where I'm like, are you kidding me? Why are you doing that to yourself? Whether it be gambling, uh, sex addiction, whatever i've seen a lot and i don't have to walk too far to find it nor do most of us mm -hmm. now it's very hard when somebody that you love is living out a drama and you can see how painful the role they're taking is but if we impose upon them and diminish them then by definition of what james Carson is sharing in the passage you just read we are actually practicing evil yep and then you're not playing the game fairly a game is a game only because first a game requires a world a world is a place that has defined borders and a game requires spectators that are not in the game they're watching the game like if you're in the stands at a football game you're a spectator you're not a football player mm -hmm. but the world is created by the stadium or you could say by everybody watching, because a world is anywhere where there's a circumscribed area with spectators, 
and the spectators are watching the game, not in the game. Okay, so if if we are forcing people out of their game into our game because for some reason their game is making us uncomfortable, like it's uncomfortable to watch your own brother be a drug addict. It's uncomfortable to watch him get thrown in jail, then get thrown in prison. So if I had a spiritual depth at the time to really just have empathy and compassion for him and not try to fix him and, and just say, you know, what's really going on inside of you? What are you looking for? Instead of trying to say he was wrong, then I wouldn't have taken the position of threatening his position and telling him about how he's ruining the family and, and you know, whatever the mind right. conjures up. Because really how much of that comes from our own discomfort and our own unwillingness to feel the pain through sympathetic resonance that somebody we love is creating for themselves. So often we intervene and try to stop another's game to protect us from having to feel the pain of the empathy of witnessing and being a, a, a bystander to their game because sometimes those games directly affect us, which means we're actually somewhat in the game if we choose to let us affect let it affect us negatively the tricky part about the world that we're in now is because and that and of course that makes perfect sense and that you know what we should not do is impinge upon others people's rights to play their game unless their game is impinging upon our right to play our game then then now we're simultaneously in the game and they're on one side of the field and we're on the other right and 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 one of the challenges is is that in this in this COVID world, there's the idea that if you're playing the game where you believe your own beliefs, and that belief includes that these masks aren't effective and that they aren't necessary, neither is social distancing, afraid. right? So, and you're you're playing that game. The game that the, everybody else is playing is giving them the justification to impinge upon your game, yes. to yell at you, to ridicule yeah. you, because they're idea is that you're now spreading germs that could affect them yes, and their ability to play their sovereign game yeah. of health yes right and so it's given everybody permission to you know impose upon oppose upon everybody else's game and it's, so it's kind of devolved the whole sovereignty of allowing somebody to be who they want to be and if you want to choose to go and dance together if you want to choose to go and you know this bar is open and you can do it now all of a sudden with this contagion theory idea of everything that's yeah. going on there's this like right to impose their you know tyrannical will upon everybody else yes so there's lots that I can say about that, but let's wind back because you've used a magic word twice in this explanation. Ideas. Okay. The standard gold standard test for determining who has COVID is the PCR test, which is scientifically inept at diagnosing a coronavirus as an illness. It's not even for that. The inventor himself said it should never be used for that. And I've seen studies ranging between 65 and 90% false positives, which means there'll be that many false negatives. So what we have is an illusion based on the illusion of objectivity. And nobody that I know of has ever actually had a coronavirus and said, here it is. They may have one in Wuhan lab, but that's part of the illusion. We don't know if it's out here or not. There's no, uh, D Donald Trump got COVID. Yeah. How did you determine that? Mm -hmm. And when we find out that doctors are being told by <laughs> medical boards to diagnose anybody with anything that even remotely looks like COVID as COVID, but anything that remotely looks like COVID looks like about 140 other diseases, including the common flu. So we created this whole stack of ideas like a house of cards but people are worshiping it as though it's real to the point that they have lost their jobs, lost their homes, are living in tents and running around in masks and actually believing. And we know from placebo and nocebo trials that those things are significantly more powerful than most drugs. Mm -hmm. So, and we also know from metaphysics that if you put enough energy into any thought, it attracts matter to itself. So here's the paradox. If you really take, quantum physics and science of mind 
we're on the verge of right now of manifesting the virus and a test to make it legitimate because we need to validate our own idea and we are putting so much energy into it, we are creating a real dragon collectively. And when everyone turns to any channel and gets the same message, you can see how easily they would believe it, but that does not make it true at all. How many people, for example, think that the devil is not God and exists somehow separate from God? Now, I would say most of the world population believes that. But that right there says to me, look, you have to ask yourself a fundamental question. What does the word God mean? And if you actually understand what the word God means, it means if there's any devil, it is God's creation. Or there is no God. And if you have two gods, one called God and one called the devil, you're stuck with another problem. Who created them? And that's where you should be focusing, right? So you see, we all kind of are at a point now where we have to realize smoke and mirrors are very profitable. Impossibility walls are only impossible for people that can't think and don't ask bigger questions. And the question is, do we have a pandemic or do we have an epidemic of technology coupled with ideas used in such an effective way that people are now conditioned to the point where they don't even ask questions because they've been programmed what to think, not how to think. The instant this pandemic was announced, I turned to both my wives and said, I can assure you, we are now entering into the biggest hoax ever pulled on humanity, only matched closely by the First and Second World War, but now they can't afford to start a world war, so they're doing it invisibly. And they're going to put us all in an invisible jail and make us highly profitable. And this is the beginning of a war where there's no sides. And that makes it even more profitable. Scary. And, it's you know, it, scary, but damn, is it exciting. Yeah, I mean, if, if, we're boy, talking about, if we're talking about wanting to incarnate at a time where we can be warriors that stand, yes. not, with the, not with the imposition of evil, not with yep. the destruction, not with where's the sniper rifles and all of the, the ways that yep. we've looked at war in the past, but standing in our own love, in our own truth, in our own freedom with an invitation, like you said, laying yep. out the bird seed saying, look, here I am, you know, beyond fear, yeah. you know, beyond all of these constructs. And, you know, here's my hand. I'm not going to go grab you, nope. but if you want to come hold my hand, go for it. And the more people that do that, maybe this is the exact necessity that we needed to wake up. To it, the it, it is absolutely, in my opinion, we have fallen into a trap of global unconsciousness that really began strongly at the beginning of the industrial age and we have been look if you study the history of our education systems it was started by plantation owners to teach slaves exactly what to do and what not to do thinking for yourself was absolutely frowned upon because it disrupted things like assembly lines so the entire education system was built by what we will call metaphorically the kings and the queens of the world, specifically to condition the minds of the slaves of the world to do exactly what they wanted them to do. So they did not teach you how to think. They taught you exactly what to think. And anything more than that is called creativity and it does not help the bottom line. And if it does, we'll decide and you won't get any of the money. Okay. In other words, they'll take your idea and sure. pat you on the back and make more millions off of it. So what we've got right now is we have got a situation where our consumerist mythology that says as long as you aren't happy, all you got to do is buy something and it'll make you feel better. Which, which is, is proven false. Which is very false, but is also exquisitely profitable to those making the products that supposedly make you feel better and has been for a long time. This is why marketing is so important. When we realize that we have been given white sugar, we've been given alcohol, we've been given to bad tobacco, 
We've been given television, and people, I tell people all the time, you better pay attention to what the word means. You think it means just watching a box sitting on near the wall. Television actually means tell a vision. There's an old saying in Christianity. The ministers and the preachers say, if you give me a child, I will give you a preacher. Why? Because when you have a child with an open mind, you can tell it a vision and it believes it. Yeah, conditioning. So you can condition that person easily. We've become passive by turning our trust and authority figures over, tur turning our trust over to authority figures, not taking care of our own health, believing what doctors say even when it's not working, believing what scientists say even when it's killing people. We have been so conditioned to the structure of hierarchy that only a few of us question and say, wait a minute, is it really true? And people are willing to have their organs cut out and their life ruined without actually questioning the authority, which causes a lot of pain in families because there's inevitably somebody in there says, wait a minute, there's other ways to do this and the battle's on. So what I'm saying is by all definitions, we have been kept unconscious. And what have they done for thousands of years with mystics who woke up and started telling us the truth. Crucifixion. They, crucif they burn them, torture them, and get them the fuck out of Dodge because it screws up the programming plan. But ultimately, you know, the thing that's working in the favor of, if you want to call it the light or working in the favor of love, is that this, these, you know, these patterns of incessant, you know, infinite quest for power, the Sisyphean challenge to gain more power and more billions and more control... It ultimately doesn't lead to happiness and you can look at any of these studies no. and it ultimately consumes itself but it's almost like someone who's just trying to push it to the final envelope where it actually destroys itself so that it can be destroyed so that it can be actually reborn and alchemized as something else and that's what we're kind of seeing in the world these forces have just gotten so entrenched and so greedy and they've bought into this idea so much that more power will actually liberate them and get them to that feeling where they can actually feel love power being that saccharine surrogate for actual real love and then this constant quest they've you know pushed this pushed this different agenda and however you want to believe it you know however whether it's a real virus or whether people are capitalizing on the virus you know certainly there seem to be a, a rise in excess deaths what's that from you know when will that level out you know there's a lot of factors and i'm not trying to you know i think you have a more defined opinion about the virus than i do but either way the power structures behind it it's obvious the censorship that's at a new level oh my God. i mean everything that's being projected is it's clear that there's something going on, you don't whatever have to your be beliefs are. a very are. good detective to smell a rat in the house here. I mean, come on. Yeah. But you see, the thing is, is that there's something I want to say in relationship to what you just shared. Everything you just said is true, but there's one other factor I feel needs to be added into the mix. We allow it. Until we don't. We participate. Yo, no fucking doubt. And that's you know the thing. You know how many like Christians I've talked to? that said, yeah, I know the Bible's a bunch of bullshit, and yeah, I know that this devil shit, and yes, I know the Catholic Church is full of pedophiles, but I just like to go, my family goes, I'm in the habit of going, so they just turn a blind eye to it and keep putting money in the hat that's feeding tremendous amounts of destruction. Yeah, people know that their cigarettes are full of carcinogens, but they say, oh, I just like smoke, and I'm, I don't fucking care. Yes, I know I'm drinking myself under the table, but I just like it, and that's what it means to be unconscious. The challenge that people don't consciously recognize is that being unconscious is comfortable because it's easy. How hard do you have to work to get your body to digest food? Do you have to think about it? How about breathing? How about having a shit? How about making your whiskers grow? How about blinking your eyes? How about circulating your blood? You're managing 30 trillion trillion biochemical reactions a second without thinking about it through the power of your unconscious mind but the instant i say aubrey i want you to count your heartbeats for 20 minutes and don't miss a beat now you have to become conscious and within 20 minutes you'll be exhausted mm -hmm. consciousness is not only the great liberator but it's the great destroyer because you see as soon as you're conscious 
of a virus that could kill you and ruin your life, whether it's true or not, you now have to maintain the awareness and look for it everywhere and make sure everyone's wearing masks and it burns up a truckload of energy. And that's exactly why David Bohm said, real thinking is hard work. Mm. Anyone that spends time like I do tackling the big problems, it's a meditation. I have to do the same thing I got to do for a workout. Okay. I got to go figure out this death thing. I book out time. I do the research, I do specific meditations, I treat it just like I'm working on my body in the gym or um, building a new exercise program for a patient with a back injury. It takes a lot of effort and the more knowledge you have, the harder it hurts, the more it hurts when you see, look, I've been teaching people for a long time, Dr. Happy, Dr. Diet, Dr. Movement, Dr. Quiet eat real food, get to bed on time, don't get sucked into the gimmicks, have fun, but know there's laws that go to a physical body and you're in nature, you're part of nature, so if you break the laws of nature, then you're going to come at a cost. People used to think I was nuts talking about food allergies, they thought I was nuts talking about Swiss balls, you know, I've been called an idiot, a cult leader, everything for, for many fucking years. And only 20 years later, people come back and say, oh my God, Paul, I just realized you were telling us the truth 20 years ago about other stuff. I was talking about cold water therapies and cold showers 14, 15 years ago before anyone ever heard of Win Hoff or any of these other guys. And people said, oh, this guy's a nut. He wants me to take a cold shower. They thought I was a nutcase, right? People are just slow to learn, right? It doesn't matter how good the idea is. I say, look, quit drinking coffee and start your day with a cold shower, and if you need a coffee at lunch, go take a cold shower. And then if you still need coffee, drink just as much as you need and no more. You can't, you, people pay me 750 bucks an hour and I can barely get them to do that sometimes. So what am I saying? Consciousness takes a lot of brain power. It burns up a lot of energy. Your brain uses 80% of the available blood sugar in your bloodstream anytime you're consciously engaged or cognitively engaged. Like if you're thinking, what is two plus two? How many times have any of you in this room walked out of a test in school exhausted? Of course. Because you had to be conscious and your brain is the most inefficient organ in your body. So the point that I'm making is we cannot afford to be unconscious anymore. Just running off programming. We can't afford to run off programming because it makes us too vulnerable to predators. It makes us too slow to make changes as the environment's changing. And it does not grow us into the level of conscious beings that the world needs because we as human beings owe it to nature to use our awareness of science, biology, technology, agronomy. Every science we have has been telling us since Rachel Carlson, we're destroying our own home. We're shitting in our own water. We're pissing in our own food as a metaphor, yet people don't pay attention to it. Well, guess what? Boys and girls, the bees are almost gone. The trees are almost gone. The bar barrier reefs are dying. The oceans are poisoned. We're filling the, now we're filling space with junk and satellites to the point that researchers say we're putting a great threat to ourselves because once those propulsion systems don't work anymore, they can come crashing to the earth. And here we are talking about launching 20,000 5G satellites, for God's sakes. I mean, the price of being unconscious is high. COVID is, in my opinion, a welcomed visitor. An absolute clarion call, wake up call. Why? What? Because it's not really a threat. It's an illusion. So it's giving us a chance to wake up in the face of a holographic dragon that is being projected. So as much as Bill Gates drives me nutty, <laughs> he is actually doing the important service of evil to give us all a choice to tear down the impossibility wall and say, thank you, Bill. We will take responsibility for our bodies. We'll take responsibility for whether or not we vaccinate our children. And we will also take responsibility for rehabilitating the medical system and the government so we actually have one. And we will make sure that large corporations and billionaires do not get inside of governments and corporations like the medical system or anywhere else that should be only run by a democracy for the people, by the people, because we've now had about 
uh, 5,000 years of kings and queens that have been keeping us in the dark and playing with our heads. <clears throat> so the question really boils down to one question. Are you ready to be an adult and accept responsibility <laughs> for yourself and the world and realize that what you do to this planet, you do to yourself and we're all you got to do is read The Future of Life by Edward O. Wilson, who's won over 100 awards for science and is a highly esteemed professor. And in the book, The Future of Life, he makes it dead clear that we are the largest cause of extinctions on this planet and we're killing shit faster than Mother Earth can create it. And we're undermining our very existence. I mean, I could go on for hours. All of this is just unconscious behavior that makes a few people rich and makes us seem like we're comfortable. But guess what? Steiner warned, human life depends on two things, bees and trees. And when they reach a critical level, life will cease to exist as you know it. And we're right there, right now. And everyone's busy watching the TV to see what COVID's doing. We're destroying the planet and everyone's worried about whether they got a mask on. We're worried about racism. Let me tell you, racism is a pimple on an elephant's ass compared to the condition this planet is in. It won't matter a bit when you're hungry. Because if you get hungry enough, you'll kill anybody. No matter what color they are, unless you're spiritually evolved enough. Or align with anybody. And that's, you know, that's that's why you know, I was with a shaman recently and he in his invocation prayer, he says, the evil serves the light. And the reason why the evil serves the light is exactly this. Everything that's coming is putting us in a point. I mean, I, we would love to imagine that humans move from pure awareness, consciousness, and inspiration. But really, a lot of times, it takes desperation. It takes rock bottom. Yes. It takes that point where you're like, okay, okay, okay. Enough is enough. I can't ignore this anymore. This is affecting my life now, and I'm fucking sick of it. Yep. And so let's go arm in arm with our brothers and sisters and create a new world that will continue the game on and on, the yep. infinite game, this incredible opportunity for incarnation on this beautiful blue planet. Yep. And let's fucking keep this going, not just for me, but for a hundred generations yes. behind me because I am the, I am life itself. And my job is to continue life itself. And so thank you to all the darkness that's restricting that because yep. it's building a fight inside me. It's building a yes. sacred rage. Yes. It's building that kind of yes. inner spiritual warrior that says, okay, okay, I'm awake now. I'm, I'm not going to worry about the trivialities of my fucking relationship drama and this little drama and this little business drama. Like yeah. I'm here for life and I'm going to yeah. fight for life. Yeah. And that's and fuck it, if I go out on my shield because life gets destroyed, at least I'll know, you know that I gave it a fucking everything. If you and I die knowing we did the best we could to help others wake up, clean up, grow up, and show up, we, we, we can't have done more. We cannot, I went through a midlife crisis because I burned myself out trying to save the world. And I realized you can't save the world because the world is devoted for this very process. The world is one place in the universe where God sends souls to wake up to their creative powers and wraps us in matter because it slows spirit down so much that we can't do too much destruction. But when you go to the astral plane or the mental plane, you create at the speed of thought. And right here on this planet, research shows the average person thinks 68,000 thoughts a day of which 90% are negatively oriented. You do that in the, in the astral plane, you'll destroy many, many other beings. So we actually come as souls to be wrapped in matter where everything moves very slowly and we all have a chance to interact with each other so that when we graduate out of this plane, we're adult enough with the powers of the magic of consciousness to respect other life and to be a citizen of the universe. So the earth is a schoolyard for snotty-nosed children that don't know any better <laughs> And these events are the events that say, guess what, boys and girls, class is coming to an end, and this is your test. If you figure out what's real and not real, you get to graduate. And when you figure out what's real, you'll realize that what's really real is all the insects and all the birds and all the bees and all the flowers and all the trees that you've turned into computers, iPhones, and leather pants and stupid shit that doesn't make a goddamn bit of difference unless you learn to eat plastic and aren't human anymore. So what I'm saying is, is that this is the end of a cycle. And what was the big fear about 
the year 2000, that the world was coming to an end. But the Mayans' long count is coming to an end. But the reality of it is we're in a transitional state. 2012 was the end of that cycle and the beginning of a new one. And the beginning of the new one is, okay, boys and girls, it's time to clean the schoolhouse up because a new class is going to start. And the new class is, wake up. <clears throat> wake up. You can't be snot-nosed kids just eating Cheerios and staring at porn all day and smoking pot till you're just a complete <laughs> fucking useless bum and getting government handouts going, cool, man, I don't have to work anymore. Yeah, but you don't realize those government handouts are funded by your tax dollars. You didn't get any goddamn handout. You just got tricked again <laughs> <laughs> into more Cheerios and more sugar and more poor me stories. And it's just like, to, to me, this, you know, I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, dude, that when they put you through training, they make it intensely real as they can get without destroying their own soldiers. Why? Because you got to get ready for a battlefield. Shit's going to happen. Heads are going to come off. Blood's going to fly. You can't lose your composure. And the only way we can get you ready is to really just beat the shit out of you, mess your head up, and make you think this is the worst thing in the world and ask you every 10 seconds, would you like to give up and go see mommy now and have a cold meal or a warm meal? Would you like a shower? You don't have to be here. They offer you to quit and they make it more intense and they say, you can leave any time. There's Ring a bus the right there. Yeah. Just, just give up, right? Well, right now is not a time to give up. Right now is a time to say, oh boy, we have some really big issues, far bigger than COVID. We have all got to collectively decide how we're going to get energy without mining coal out of the earth and destroying the planet. We got to decide... Do we still want to have racism? Do we still want to have wars over religious ideals? Do we still want to have an education system that doesn't work? Do we still want to have a banking system that's completely ripping us off? Do we still want to have a medical system that doesn't work and is the 37th most effective and the most expensive in the world? And the list just goes on and on and on. So I say, hey, guess what? The alarm just went off. It's time to stop sleeping. And if you don't wake up, they're going to restrict everything you got. They're going to watch everything you got, put you in invisible jail, take your money and farm you like a little piggy in a commercial farm and slaughter you at will. And, you know, you look at all the great stories and all these stories, you know, Jordan Peterson, I think one of his great ideas is he calls them true stories, even when they're fictions, even when a Marvel movie, when they get it right, it's a true story. And every single hero is always pit in a situation where the stakes are really high. And every video game that we've ever rented, every role playing game, every idea is the stakes are fucking high. And that's what calls the hero forward. That's it. You know, everybody's a yep. farmer, happy to do their own thing. You know, you look at all the, you know, Gladiator, for example, he was just happy chilling on his farm. Everybody, Braveheart. You know, William Wallace would have been with Murrin in his little hut and they would have made little Wallace babies and, you know, had fun throwing rocks at things. And he would have had, an, but all of a sudden something came mm -hmm. and it, it woke a hero inside him. And we're all at this opportunity where, the hero is getting woken up, and let's be fucking grateful for that. And I'm let's excited say like, about it. Hell yeah. All I'm right, here we go. It. You know the reason I'm excited about it? If we were entering into a world war right now, that's some dangerous shit, pal. There's like 23 countries around the world with nuclear weapons pointed at each other. We have enough nuclear weapons to destroy the planet entirely 179 times over. Okay? So the military-industrial complex had to come up with a new way to make lots of money. And that's to create a war within, globally, and invest in high security and 5G satellite systems and viruses that have vaccines that have tracking chips in you that tell you everything they want to know so they can control you even more. So what they've done is they've turned the military industrial complex in like an antibody that's now eating itself and we're going to publicly fund it too. That's the, that's the <laughs> genius of it all. Right. And so people think, Oh, my phone is so great. Yes. They're listening to everything you say. They know exactly when you're smoking pot. They know when you're taking it up the ass. They know when you're cheating <laughs> Jesus and they can come get you any fucking time you want. And your lawyer ain't going to help because they've got, they can film you. They got everything you download. You are being watched like never in the history of man, you know? So, the reality of it is, is that this, there's no bombs flying. 
there's just an illusion flying. Mm. And so far, the research shows that no more people died of COVID than the seasonal flu. In fact, some statistics say less. So how much of this death is all potentially um, A, uh, nocebo effect, people believing they got it when they probably had something else and just dying because they think that's what they're supposed to do. I mean, the mind is very powerful. Look, I've done a firewalk across 2,600 degree coals and I've watched a lot of people get burnt doing the same firewalk because they couldn't manage their mind. So if your mind can get you to walk across 2,600 degree coals with flesh, then your mind can get you to do about anything. And if your mind can get you to bend steel and do all the things we've seen human beings do, from levitating to Tibetan masters holding molten shovels against their tongue for 60 seconds and laughing about it, then the mind is very, very powerful if it's used for positive things, and it's also very powerful if it's used for negative things. And if you can convince people of anything, you got them under control. So I think, look, right now, this is the greatest wake-up call ever because ultimately <laughs> the, the biggest enemy you got is your own mind and the laziness of not thinking it out and getting together collectively. And what a great time to get together and say, Aubrey, you're my buddy. You got reach. Let's get a few other guys like me and you and Ben Greenfield or Joe Rogan or whoever, um, if they're not already bought and paid for, and say, let's sit down at the table and say, how can we extend some love to the rest of the world and help them out of this impossibility wall, yet honor the people that want to stay invested in it? Yeah. Right? And say, here's our offering. Right? And, and, and so what it does is it brings the spiritual warriors together for a higher cause, and it brings the practitioners of evil together for their cause, and out of the two is guaranteed growth. There would have been no Fellowship of the Ring if it wasn't for the rise of Sauron and Saruman and the two towers. The dwarves and the elves and the hobbits and the wizards would have all just gone along doing their own business. But that rise was what created the Fellowship. And we're at the time of the Fellowship now. And, and this is it. And fucking amen. And Let's as I go. said to God, God, why do you keep trying to destroy yourself? I can't. <laughs> okay. So the impossibility wall that we're facing ultimately is this thing called death. And that's the worst thing that can happen to any of you. But the fun part of it is when you die, you actually find out the truth of yourself and you realize you live eternally. And what we thought was a whole lifetime in the scope of the universe is so fast that you can't even call it an instant. You can just call it a, a now. You, know, you, you get mm -hmm. my point? Like yeah. uh, our life of a hundred years, let's say, compared to even the life of our son at 10 billion estimated years, which may be wrong, but it's still just a relative reality. The earth's supposed to be what, four point something billion years old. The human life is like a firefly coming and going. So when you realize, oh my God, that was just the most amazing freaking charade ever. I had so much fun. I got the shit scared out of me. <laughs> I got to believe that I was going to die of a virus <laughs> or I got blown up fighting, flying my fighter jet. But man, I got to kill a few bad guys too. At the end of the day, when you get deep enough into God, you see this is all absolutely fucking incredible. You think IMAX is good? How about just I? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I love you, brother. I love you too. I love, I love, you. <laughs> I love your team too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been beautiful, man. For everybody listening, um, your podcast is one of my favorite podcasts to listen Thank to. Thank you. You got some, and and I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. I wish I had, uh, you know, kind of the time and intention. I to don't do either, more but I do it. listen to yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, brother. Yeah, likewise. I thought yours so. with. Uh tom kellen was fantastic yeah thank you thank you so i highly recommend living 4d with paul, paul check, with paul yeah. check and uh you got some great books and a bunch of youtubes and things out there so but again just thank you for being that light thank you for sharing that love and that truth and uh it's uh it's just beautiful to know you and serve with you in these times yeah thank you i i, I have uh i can only say the same i mean hey takes two to dance and two to make love and I'm just glad you invited me to swing the swing around the rosy with you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Love everybody. Peace. Uh -ho. Thanks for checking out this video. For more uh, like it, please fun. subscribe to my channel. And of course, the Aubrey Marcus podcast with new episodes every single week. And follow me on Instagram at Aubrey Marcus.
Thank you so much.